Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining this workshop today on boosting uh, participatory democracy and how we can find uh, the optimal tools in order to enhance participatory democracy at the EU level, but also at the local and national levels in Europe. So my name is Elisa and I work for the European Citizen Action Service. We are an NGO here based in Brussels, empowering citizens to exercise their rights. And of course, uh, some of the rights of EU citizenship is also the right of participating in the EU decision-making processes. And uh, actually, we have been working a lot on digital democracy, which is how technology nowadays can help also these processes to um, to, uh, in, um, to have citizens participate more in decision-making and policy-making. So today we will have a very, very interesting discussion with our speakers coming from very different um, um, sectors of our society. We have, uh, of course, our keynote speaker, who is uh, MEP Laurent Vince. And uh, he is actually the one who guided and who uh, um, was the leader of the European Citizens Initiative Minority Safe Pack, uh, which probably you know has reached more than one million signatures and was very, very successful. So we're going to be having him as the, uh, the keynote speaker, as a, a practitioner, but also a new MEP in the European Parliament. Then we will have also Karsten Berg, who is the founder of the ECI campaign, um, actually also a, a friend of ICAS because we have been working together as NGOs uh, in, um, for, since a very long time on making this transnational tool work for participatory democracy. And of course, uh, we have also the Vice President of uh, the European Parliament today, Mr. Rainer uh, Wieland. Um, unfortunately, our, um, the chair of the PETI committee, uh, Ms. Dolores Montserrat, couldn't join us in the end, but we're very, very happy to have Mr. Wieland, who is also a substitute in the PETI, in the Petty committee, um, who has long-term experience, of course, in the European Parliament, who will give us also some uh, notions of how this is working, and also on the right of inquiry and the right of initiative, which you have been also leading the processes in this sense. And of course, last but not least, we also have uh, Attila Zas, who is uh, um, deputy chief uh, editor of uh, a radio. And uh, it's the Radio Targu Mures, if that's the right pronunciation. And he will be telling us how important, of course, communication is as a part of participatory democracy, obviously, but also how local initiatives can also help uh, citizens uh, um, participate more in policy making, as he has some practical examples uh, which he has been running on local territories. So I will start immediately by giving uh, Laurent the floor, the floor, just so you know, after each speaker, um, I will open the floor to the public, so in case you have some burning questions, I will just pick one or two immediately so that you can ask directly to the speaker those burning questions. And if not, we will move forward to the next speaker, and in the end, uh, um, I will open again the floor for other questions to any of the speakers that you want. So, here you go. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot, Elisa. Very, uh, very good morning uh, to uh, all of you. Uh, congratulations to the Martin Center, Director Mikulaj Zurinda, for, uh, for today's uh, event. I think uh, the net at work becomes uh, the flagship event of, of the Martin Center uh, here in Brussels and the um, US president of the uh, uh, center have, have been promoted a lot the, this event. I think it is important that in different clusters and different uh, EU policies we, we have uh, a debate. And uh, our uh, topic, participatory democracy, is uh, particularly interesting from a citizen's point of view. Uh, because uh, uh, perhaps the, uh, the level of knowledge about the EU institutions and the level of participation of the citizens in the uh, different uh, uh, EU elections and, uh, and EU-related uh, uh, consultation are in a, in a direct uh, uh, relationship. Um, more uh, people get information about the EU, how this affects uh, their life, more they will be interested in the process of uh, decision-making uh, and making proposals, actually, to the EU. I remember from, from the election campaign, um, for some citizens, um, 
Brussels is a, diff uh, a distant uh, 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 theater of, uh, uh, of political game, and uh, it is, uh, they don't feel it belongs to them or that it is affecting directly their lives. But when you start to explain how much of the Brussels regulation is affecting actually their, their life uh, uh, economy and so on, they just realize that most of the uh, important decisions are made in uh, Brussels. Uh, it's a question of communication, of course, because many national governments, uh, uh, when uh, they achieve, uh, uh, even in EU policies, some good results, they say that is the merit of the government, and then something is going wrong, then it is the fault of Brussels. And then, of course, you have a, a, a conflict at the level of the uh, citizens um, as well. Um, the EU, in the way it was uh, designed, uh, does not fit, I believe, the standard um, uh, representative democracies pattern. Uh, even the, 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 uh, the role and uh, the competencies of the European Parliament show that. Uh, the fact that uh, directly the European Parliament has no right of initiative, though there were uh, several examples that, that go uh, beyond that. But this is not affecting the legitimacy of the European Parliament and its um, uh, institution, but it goes more also to the uh, um, field of output uh, uh, legitimacy. This means that uh, this legitimacy exists behind uh, the uh, institutional uh, framework and uh, uh, scope. Um, I think uh, uh, the participatory mechanisms and practices when developing the legislation, even though this was limited to functional intermediaries, such as trade associations, employers associations and NGOs, uh, is reducing the picture about uh, the, the EU system because citizens also had a long time opportunity, tools to uh, challenge the EU's action. The Maastricht uh, uh, Treaty gave every EU citizen the right to uh, present, uh, to submit a petition to the European Parliament uh, on an issue that falls within the European fields of activity and not only, because of course citizens submit also in, in other topics uh, uh, the petitions, and uh, citizens also have the possibility to address directly the Ombudsman of the uh, EU. However, the sphere of activity of the EU enlarged meanwhile, and um, probably this is the reason that the citizens' initiative as a tool was introduced in the Lisbon Treaty, giving a, a direct uh, role to the, to the citizens to ask for legal acts from the uh, European uh, uh, Commission. Now, I, there is always uh, a discussion but I don't see it as a conflict. I see it as a, a chance to, to uh, put on table different options, representative democracy and direct democracy. Representative dim democracy, democracy means, of course, that the citizens entrust their representatives to go with the different institutions and make decisions on their behalf. On the other hand, in this world where uh, uh, um, the politi political scene and uh, important issues for the citizen are, are uh, so quickly changing, then also the direct uh, uh, citizen uh, uh, involvement has its uh, uh, reasons and its legitimacy. And uh, finding the right balance, I mean, how can the uh, direct participation become effective? It's a very good question. And how the uh, a political representation is enough if it's, it's a sort of cohabitation uh, with the citizens. Uh, well, now that is, I think, uh, the, the question that maybe it's worth uh, deba debating uh, in this uh, uh, discussion. About the citizens' initiative, if we look at the numbers, uh, more than 70 initiatives started, uh, uh, were started by, by the citizens, and uh, only six of them managed to, uh, uh, to gather the more than one million signatures. Others fall during the fight. Uh, some were withdrawn, others didn't make uh, the threshold, and so on. Uh, many were refused uh, by the commission. Um, but in the end, uh, how successful is the citizens' initiative? I believe the success, the rate of the success should be the implementation of the demand of the citizens, I mean the legal act 
that uh, commission and then uh, eventually the EU institutions uh, adopt. And from that sense, we have to say that um, uh, the result is zero because the, uh, the, 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 there are no legal acts after the four submitted uh, 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 citizens' initiative uh, in these years since the, uh, the citizens' initiative are active. Is it good? Is it bad? It's, it's a very important question, and it's not only us who ask this uh, question, but also the, the Commission. Mainly the Commission is the one who, is, uh, who has to deliver the, uh, uh, the, the result, but also the European Parliament. And uh, uh, the involvement in the European Parliament's uh, AFCO Committee, uh, Constitutional Affairs Committee and Petitions Committee was, uh, was important. In the uh, Constitutional Affairs Committee, a new regulation uh, has been adopted uh, then at the level of the Parliament, which, which will enter into force from January. This means uh, mostly um, new regulatory uh, uh, bases, but, uh, but not change in the essence, because that was uh, not even possible, because it's regulated basically uh, by the Lisbon Treaty. But some elements have been changed in order to make uh, the ECIs uh, uh, more effective, and we will have to wait for some months and years to see if this new regulation uh, brings... Uh, 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 satisfactory results for the citizens. One element, uh, for example, the fact that successful initiatives will get a plenary debate in the parliament, I think, gives uh, higher visibility uh, to the topics that the citizens um, uh, raise. Um, then maybe uh, a little point on technology, because it's a very important element of the uh, citizens' initiative, how you gather the signatures. More and more you do it in the digital way, uh, by the online uh, platforms. Uh, but still, in many rural areas, we had this experience. You do it on paper and you uh, collect the signatures one by one. But the technologi uh, technological developments uh, could bring uh, some uh, new impetus, not only in the ECI, but the whole process of uh, consultations. I think it will worth uh, introducing in the discussion uh, the consultation that the Commission, and I hope not only the Commission, but together with the Parliament and the Council will introduce on the future of Europe and uh, how which tools will be used um, in this uh, process and, and if there is any outcome already projected at the beginning of this uh, uh, process, I think we will have uh, a lot to discuss here and uh, a lot to do in the, in the next years, both in the Constitutional Affairs Committee and, uh, and the uh, Petitions uh, Committee. So thanks a lot. Okay. Well, thank you. <laughs> So, um, are there any questions uh, at the moment for Mr. Vince? It's a bit too early, I imagine. <laughs> so, uh, we will uh, move on. But, uh, yes, thank you for at least uh, giving a, a very good introduction to the discussions that we will be having today. Um, especially, I think that Karsten will have a lot to say about the, uh, the ECI. Um, but before we move on to, um, to dealing with the ECI, maybe I can ask Vice President of the European Parliament, uh, Mr. Wieland, um, a couple of things. So first of all, maybe um, about the potential and challenges of the petitions to the European Parliament as an instrument for citizens to have some sort of, um, um, let's say, um, impact on decision-making, policy-making in the European Union. But apart from participatory democracy, maybe you could also um, talk about uh, the, the EP procedures that you've been working on, on the rights of inquiry and the rights uh, um, of initiative. Because on the one hand, uh, participatory democracy is crucial in order to uh, um, reinforce representative democracy. And on the other hand, maybe there are still a few things to be done at the European level in order to also reinforce the representative democracy that we have, meaning reinforcing maybe the parliament, uh, as it still doesn't have the right of uh, initiative uh, to, to uh, make a legislative proposal. It's still a right of the commission. Um, so apart from participatory democracy, are there ways that in the next five years, we should be striving for also better representation in this sense. Well, <coughs> better representation. Uh, this is, in fact, this is a, um, another issue. I mean, uh, possibly you invited me in this um, 
cozy um, around uh, just to strengthen things um, you possibly uh, have on several from several points angles from this uh, panel um, I think I I understand my role now to drop also a bit water into the wine um, in the first place for me the the core piece of democracy is the representative democracy. I think we have developed nothing better and the say of the citizens is higher than ever in history. Higher than ever in history. Uh, the second, uh, therefore, I want to clearly say for me the exercise is not to invent a participatory, a participatory democracy but to safeguard participation in democracy. And this is something not for all people the same. Um, third point, um, I clearly want to stress that um, in democracy legitimation is something very important. And legitimation is nothing which has to do with self-reference. And I see a lot of self-reference. Um, I see a lot of industry. It's a new service industry to deliver the citizens. And for me, it is very clear that I always ask, where is the legitimation of an NGO? How many members have they? How sustainable they work there? Um, and how is the inner democracy of an organization. If you look to some organizations, it's not even possible to become a member anymore. Uh, one of the very prominent uh, organizations, you cannot become a member. Uh, there are only 10 or 20 or 30 members. It's a closed job, it's self-referential, and so I do not think that all what comes from that age is sheer democracy as I um, uh, believe in. Um, same, by the way, same with the lobby. Yeah, the lobby has clear interests, but others have also interests. And some NGOs, they try to earn money with that. Yeah? They try to sell books. They try to, um, um, to get um, uh, in, in, in television. They try to get donations. Sometimes with uh, the daily scandal, they try to um, uh, point out and this is something which um, of course brings I don't want to say pressure but it brings um, reactions uh, onto politics and um, this brings me to the question how it can be handled first point both of you um, mentioned technical issues I think we really have to look whether there is a new technical gap created uh, on the issue of um, upload filter. I got some 20,000, more than 20,000 uh, 20, emails. In the first round in last year in late summer, the Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung, they found out that, that about the half of the first reactions via email came from uh, IP addresses uh, located in the United States. Um, so somewhere the member has not a real chance to find out where an, a reaction comes from, whether it's only a, an issue of five clever boys who understood to create a wave or whether, or whether those are really 20,000 concerned citizens. It's, I think this is a technical challenge because um, um, uh, the reaction of the, of, of the people should not base on a fake, it should be more or less real. The second technical gap um, is the question how we organize, how we organize the, the mechanisms. I mean, if you look, my party in the moment is, um, is starting to create a new basic program which is a two years process, and all the members have their say. Uh, I want to uh, bring people to discuss things, but I do not want to create the impression that 
one sentence they worked out will be written at the end in, in, the, in the final product. Because this would, we, we need something like expectations management. Um, and if we now organize hearings and consultations by the Commission, and this has from the industry, from the lobby, from, uh, from NGOs, but also from normal citizens, you get 100,000, 200,000 letters. We create the impression that, ev that somebody read all these reactions, which is not the case. It's machine reading, filtering out ideas. If it comes to a normal citizen and he says, if a real human being would have read that, it would have been recognized that this is a very clever idea and this would have survived the first round. So it's a scandal that this is organized by machines. And therefore, I think this is a dangerous gap because we create expectations we cannot serve. And it's not even desirable that we can serve that. So the question is how we organize that filter um, and give it a credibility to those who send us uh, opinions. And this brings me to the next point. We really have to take care that in this new technical world, world we do not organize a society um, where, <coughs> where, the, um, there, where there is a participatory democracy in favor of the urban people on the expenses of the rural people, the, um, the young on the expenses of the old, the loud on the expenses of the decent, the rich on the expenses of the poorer ones, um, the learned ones uh, with the less educated people, um, and if you want, the white collar jobs on the expenses of the blue collar jobs. I, I had, a, I had a, an experience where we discussed about the reactions on an election and I, and I talked on, on a normal table, I talked, <coughs> I read this in the net, that in the net, and that, that in the net, and somebody told me, I cannot read that all, I have to work. And people who are doing blue collar jobs um, at eight um, hours a week, uh, nine to five, they have a reduced limitation, li li reduced limits to have access for their desires, to have access to information than others um, have to do, which have a completely different uh, life situation. Therefore, the, in the idea of random citizens is a very interesting one. This is uh, performed by Bertelsmann, so that we have a, a huge amount of reactions. Then we have the filter of random citizens, and after that, politics is going to that. Because the gap is, of course, that we have things like youth parliament, which, which gives the perception that this is a other sort of democracy. It is not. It is a pupil picked out by a teacher, sent to a place, meeting other people picked out by a, by, by a teacher, and then they vote delegates and they, they give the perception they are real, a real parliament. They are not. They are not. We should, we should exercise those formats, but we should not give them the earmark, this is another way um, of parliament. And um, the question is whether we have a democracy of one issue, donkeys, where people say, hey, I'm now interested in politics. Yeah. So I sign a citizen's initiative. But for me, politics, I learned in my party, is that, of course, I had interests, better schools for pupils. But then I went into party, I wanted to just discuss all that, but other people came and said, well, my issue is another one. Help me to discuss that. And so I was forced to look also on things where I'm not interested at all but I was forced to discuss this with others and contribute to a common opinion on certain things. And this is the character of democracy, and the question is how we can uh, put both of those things um, uh, into it. And um, so um, the petition, the character of petition has completely changed. About 10 years ago, we had the petition against Nord Stream, Nord Stream 1, with 
200 or 300 um, signatures. This is not the petition a, pe a petition is originally dealing with. A petition is that four weeks ago somebody wrote me and said, listen, I had a holiday in Italy and I went to the Caracalla town. Yeah, and I saw that there is a price of 11 euro and it's reduced for students, students, it's reduced for pensioners and it's reduced for Italians. For Italians. This is against European law. And I said, hey, do a petition, I will walk with that because it's clearly, and, and those things, the petition com ha committee has changed over the years, but in some respects the petition committee is misused for general political issues, which is my opinion, not is the case. So we should clearly differ the petty. The petty. We should clearly differ of the issues um, of the ombudsman. We should clearly differ the enquiry, which is a parliamentary right and a parliamentary minority right. It's not a citizen's right. We should have the citizens in in it, in it if, um, and we should look how we can improve the consultations. Last idea with the citizen is it in it, is it, I discussed already with Mr. Berg. Of course, we, have, we had citizens in, his, in uh, successful ones um, in the past. But if you talk in Germany, you talk only about uh, right to water, for example. And they said, oh, it's a huge amount of signatures. We have to do something for that now, because so many signatures. One of the highest signed um, initiatives was one of us. The issue was that the European Union should not finance ab abortion in Africa. This temperature, the political temperature for that um, citizen initiative in the Parliament was much, was much, much lower. It was very cold in the room when this was dealt with. So we should look and strive that the citizens' initi initiative is not just only another tool for parties to campaign and corriger la fortune. And we should not uh, looking that this initiative is used in front of elections, that somebody in a country with preferential votes is influence uh, the campaign there, or somebody can, can give the impression that he's very important to his party that he gets nominated. Because this is only a chimere. Yeah? And I think we should, we should have a more clear view on these new in instruments, there are not only positive effects, we should, we should try to bring it into balance. So, sorry, I was too long. Thank you very much. I think that that was a very, very interesting uh, um, point of view on uh, especially um, how to safeguard participation in democracy and not necessarily also to uh, recreate uh, um, maybe other channels which are, are still uh, filled with challenges sometimes if we look at digital democracy for sure. Um, uh, and uh, I really um, also appreciated the fact that it is very, that you highlighted the fact that it's very hard in participatory democracy also to sometimes ensure the balance of who is answering, who is uh, really mobilizing in order to, to uh, um, implement, uh, you know, to impact decision making. Um, and it is true that, for example, the European Citizens Initiative um, requires so much human resources and financial resources that sometimes we also have the impression that, you know, uh, big NGOs are behind the European Citizens Initiative just because it's also very, very costly for a normal citizen to just use uh, uh, such a, uh, an enormous tool um, in such sense. Are there any questions, burning questions at the moment for Mr. Wieland? If not, I think that on this side <laughs> there are some. <laughs> um, there are going to be some reactions to what was just said. Um, so I will pass it to you. you want uh, to continue? Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you so yes. much, Elisa. So I think that you can uh, um, both, if you want to have a reaction to what Mr. Wieland said on uh, some really interesting points, but also on the maybe European Citizens Initiative. Yeah, 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 yeah. I would love to really comment on the super interesting com comment of Mr. Wieland. As a parliament, from a parliamentarian point of view, how to deal with citizens' participation, how to filter this, how to do this in a modernized world where we now have a technological revolution with us, 
where citizens can participate with a click or can mobilize much more than they could 10 years ago. This, I think, will change your role in the parliament also uh, considerably, and I will comment on this. Let me just say a few words on uh, the ECI campaign. My organization has been working on the European Citizens Initiative now for nearly 20 years. We were already involved in the Constitutional Convention, the Convention on the Future of Europe, you'll remember, in 2002 and 2003 where the heads of state uh, said after the Irish referendum in 2001, we need to make the European Union more transparent, more efficient, and also more democratic. Yeah? And then we said, oh, this is our chance. We want to make the European Union more participatory, because so far the European Union was perceived, at least by citizens, um, rather as a top-down classical intergovernmental structure which we can uh, help to reform if we include more participatory tools of democracy. So it is a, is a very positive approach. Yeah? We want to make democracy more interactive, more responsive between parliamentarians and the citizenry, and ultimately also to make representative democracy more representative. This is the idea and the rationale of participatory democracy, nothing else. It's not a replacement. It's not uh, something that is uh, uh, supposed to be destructive. It's supposed to be to make democracy even more alive and more efficient also. And I think uh, this was a good, uh, good start with the ECI. Just to let you know, the ECI did not really fall from heaven. It was a hard uh, interactive process which only succeeded due to two factors. First of all, we were working um, cross-party, so we were working with all parties, and especially we were working with parliamentarians, democratically elected parliamentarians from the national parliaments, which were de delegated to the Convention on the Future of Europe, and also with the European parliaments and uh, parliamentarians, especially with Mr. Alain Lamassoure from the EPP group. Without him, we would not have the European Citizens Initiative, right? Unfortunately, he's not in the parliament anymore, but he is one of the fathers and uh, of the ECI, and ultimately also the federal intergroup with Elmar Brook, in the very end said, yes, we give green light to this, and without uh, this cross-party consensus, we would not have the ECI today. I think that's very important to, 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 to remind. Um, okay, so far, uh, and, and the same approach uh, we applied when it now came to the um, reform of the ECI. We have heard already we did not see so many ECIs so far, only four successful ones, very soon another successful one, I expect, uh, with minority safe pack, which is very impressive. And um, uh, we wonder what, how does this come? Yeah? And Elisa said already it's so, it requires so many uh, resources to run a successful ECI. And uh, the, the rules are also not so um, uh, citizen-friendly yet. Yeah? And even so, the regulation in itself, the current regulation says, the ECI rules need to be citizen-friendly, simple, so as to encourage citizen participation. This is the agreement between the three main institutions. But de facto, many have been... Um, have been very disencouraged, to be very clear. We cannot go into the, all the nitty-gritty details, but uh, just to give you one example, if you want to sign a citizen's initiative in France, um, you have to provide your name, your address, your birth date, your birth uh, date, uh, and in the end, you have to provide your passport number. Uh, and mostly, signatures are being now collected uh, online. People are reluctant to write, provide so many personal data. And, uh, at the same time, uh, we found out that the French government does not even use the ID uh, numbers to verify signatures, and the regulation says only the data that is really required to verify signatures should be requested. So it is a contradiction um, of the, of the, of the uh, regulation, it's a misapplication, and uh, we are in contact with the, um, super, the, the, data, the data protection supervisor from the European uh, Union, who is confirming this position, the, the ombudsman, but it's a very hard work now really to convince also member state um, um, uh, governments to make the ECI citizens uh, friendly. So this is our day-to-day -day jobs. Uh, I could tell you many more things, for example, when you have successfully organized an ECI, like uh, uh, Mr. Laurent, then you have to verify all the signatures in each member state, and you have to go from the competent authority to the next in 28 member states. 
And this, this requires, as you said, so many energies that, that it's very, very difficult. And now this has been resolved with the new regulation. We have the file exchange service. The commission is centralizing this process. So we will have some improvements, um, but it remains to be seen if this is actually happening so much. This requires a key part of um, the reform, the usability. And then there's another dimension which was touched already by Mr. Laurent, uh, how to make ECIs more impactful. Yeah, so far, hardly any of the ECIs have led to any legislative proposal. Uh, this is, uh, we must be uh, honest about this, maybe right to water to some degree, and Ben Glyph is it, but uh, for the first five years at least, we can say for sure, it took five years right to water to see a new water directive. There was no impact at all, and this, this led many citizens to the frustration. Well, if there's no impact at all, uh, we are not he heard and uh, not even listened, uh, then it does not make sense to, to run another ECI. So what we were proposing are two things. We were looking at the citizens' initiative rights which are successful in member states, and there we have two best practices, I would say, uh, Finland and uh, in the Baltic countries, Latvia. There they have, uh, they're the citizens at least uh, nearly 50% of the citizens know about their citizens' initiative right, which is not the case with the ECI, only a very, let's be honest, very cl cl small minority knows about the citizen, European citizens' initiative. And uh, what they do differently there is the following. They, uh, they also discuss a successful citizens' initiative in Parliament and they vote on it. This is the big difference. If you know as a citizens that my parliamentarians, my representatives, will actually discuss it in main plenary and even vote on it, you have a much higher incentive. The same is true for Finland, and both of them have a very good digital participation infrastructure. Yeah, you can sign very easily with not too much data requirements, and uh, this, this is, I think, uh, the, the way to uh, the direction of travel. So we could fortunately con um, really find an agreement in, with many AFCO members and ultimately over the entire um, uh, parliament, especially thanks to Mr. Georgi Schöpflin, uh, who unfortunately now is not anymore in the parliament, who, who made exactly this proposal then to, to follow this, this idea from Latvia and Finland. Unfortunately, the Social Democrats watered this down. They said, no, we cannot say we vote on this, uh, but at least uh, the main plenary now will uh, discuss successful citizens' initiatives in plenary and the parliament can take up uh, and develop a resolution. Yeah? So this is a very, very, very positive step where I'm curious how this will be working out. Of course, when we compare national citizens' initiatives with the European citizens' initiative, the big difference is that uh, in national context you can take the, the parties and the government into account or you can take them to account in the next elections. Yeah, this, this is not possible with the European Citizens Initiative. The ECI is direct to the European Commission because that's where still is the monopoly of initiative. That was not our idea during the Constitutional Convention. We thought it should be the European Parliament to have it as well. So it is very difficult to uh, express my dissatisf dissatisfaction with the government in the European Union if I cannot even vote the Spitzenkandidat or to, to change the European Commission. Yeah? So this has effects and touches the overall uh, democratic uh, structure of the European Union, which I think, and I come now soon to my end, which I think we should discuss again as we did it in 17 years ago in 2002 and 3 in the, in the Convention on the Future of Europe. And as you know, Mrs. von der Leyen is now calling for a conference on the future of Europe, a citizens' conference for the, on, the, the, on the future of Europe, which should last two years, which is a big difference to the classical consultation uh, mechanisms. Uh, and no one knows how this is supposed to be designed yet. And, um, and now uh, I think this is something we should discuss um, how this is being designed and this could be, could be also a place to then reform also the Lisbon Treaty, yeah? um, the, the primary law of the European Citizens Initiative and of course many, many other parts of the European uh, Union because now after 10 years of the Lisbon Treaty there are many good reasons to, to change the treaty and as you have could read uh, Mrs. von der Leyen is very open for, for a new treaty change depending of course on the parliament's uh, position also she seems to be at least that was her guideline their political guideline she was writing she she depends on the European Parliament and asks the parliamentarians also to come up with initiative but I think uh, everyone should now think about this design and here, 
as Mr. Wieland said, there's a new method of citizens participation, and this are these randomly selected uh, citizens assemblies, yeah, where you where, where you do not uh, have parliamentarians or you have citizens' initiatives, but where you, where you uh, select broadly representative citizens under certain criteria, the gender, uh, from the region, rural, urban and rural, uh, age, income, and so on, and then they make a proposal and uh, give a guideline. And I think this would be, and this was our proposal during the reform process last year, we also think um, given that we don't know how representative a, a successful ECI is, as you said, um, it, it would be very good to have this as a follow-up to a successful ECI, yeah, that we combine the different methods of participation. We have the election to the parliament, we have the petition, we have the European Citizens Initiative, but in order to really uh, and help to find out if citizens' initiatives are representative, <clears throat> and I come back to my original idea, the representativity, it might be helpful to really also invite uh, a more neutral and less um, uh, affected group yeah, to make, uh, to organize such uh, randomly selected uh, citizens' uh, assembly. And last year we had this for, for the very first time in the Economic and Social Committee. It was organized by the European Commission to develop the questionnaire on the future of Europe for the consultation of the European Commission. A bit technical, I realize, but uh, so we have, as you know, we have these consultations of the European Commission on the future of Europe, and the questions were developed by a randomly selected group. This, this was organized by the Bertelsmann Foundation in cooperation with Mission Publique, the guys from, uh, from uh, Macron. And uh, this is a new method, I think, where we could uh, which we could also apply possibly on the one hand the e in the follow-up of successful ECI and also, that's my last thought, on the future of Europe as such, because no one knows how to design the conference, the citizen conference on the future of Europe. Maybe I, I leave it yeah. for, for that at the yeah, moment. Thank you very much. Well, I think that um, Karsten Berg just gave us a really, really almost in-depth overview of the history of the ECI, the current uh, um, regulation, and uh, even the future regulation and also a vision for the future of the, of the ECI as a tool for participatory democracy in the EU. Um, so we had also two different points of view here at the uh, panel. We had more about, uh, let's say, improving the existing uh, participatory democracy tools and also being careful of all of the challenges that these present, but also, let's say, um, how to um, make sure that there are more channels also combining different channels of participatory democracy. So making sure that these tools are basically complementary and never a substitute or a replacement for, for you know, s certain systems in place. So uh, um, are there any questions on the European European Citizens Initiative on this topic. If there are no questions, um, I think I will ask one question to uh, Karsten, actually. Um, this year, let's say, um, uh, we have recorded almost um, a quite a, a, a high amount of registered ECIs. Actually, this amount of ECIs is around 17 at the moment, which is really a record because we have seen this peak only in the first year of the implementation of the regulation. And then slowly, as citizens came to realize how difficult this tool was, uh, it wasn't user-friendly enough and there was not enough impact according um, to the citizens, this number really, really decreased. Uh, we reached a year in which there were maybe, maybe two or three citizens' initiatives which were record, um, registered by the Commission. But this year, for some reason, even before the implementation of the new regulations, surprisingly, we had like 17 of them. Is there an explanation? Hmm? Is there, apart from, uh, yeah, I just wanted to know maybe from both Wieland yeah. and, and Carson and Laurent if you, there is an explanation for this uh, boom of uh, Yeah, yeah it initiative. certainly cannot be connected to the reformed regulation because the reformed regulation uh, comes only in, uh, next year into force. Uh, but of course, as uh, it was said already, um, 
it is the elections, of course, huh? and uh, it, it's, it's not the record, 17, yeah, we had already 19 in 2012 and 13. In the beginning, we had a really big peak of citizens' initiatives. Uh, you you uh, registered your ECI already in 2012. It was declared as inadmissible for wrong reasons. You had to go to court. Mm -hmm. uh, now you finalize this just in this year, so we have some... Uh, so some from the initial phase still, and then indeed in 2014 we had only two, three ongoing yeah. ECIs, and let's be aware, it's very easy to register an ECI. Yeah? You just need to find seven people and then type it in in the uh, online register of the European Commission and you're registered. So uh, uh, the, the, the most difficult thing is to organize a successful ECI. And this is the criterion for measuring the success of the instrument as such. Mm -hmm. And uh, to come back to your question, this is closely collected, connected to the European Parliament's elections and uh, it shows we need to look at the config configuration of the ECI in the relation to the other institutions. Yeah? This is where we can create leverage and, and a boosting effect. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I do not want to say that you have said that, but uh, I think to measuring the success of an instrument is the outcome. Uh, it's a dangerous, I, I think it's a, it's a difficult position. Because if we have a low turnout in elections, it's because democracy is boring, bad, and biased. If we have a low outcome on citizen in initiatives, it's too complicated. It's too, um, um, too, too, too less barrier-free and all those things. Um, I think um, this is not an appropriate conclusion. Um, and uh, on the initiative itself, um, I believe that... Um, there is no main obstacles again anymore against the in right to initiative for the parliament. I mean, this is an old story now. Um, Barroso I said, I cannot give up a privilege from the, from the treaties. Mm -hmm. In the second, he said, well, I will think about if there is a demand from the parliament. He didn't say how long he thinks about. Juncker said, I think about six years, uh, six months, and then I come up or I justify why not. Mm -hmm. Now, Mrs. von der Leyen is saying, well, I take over all these ideas. I always over years said, I do not need the right to initiative because if I get it as a parliament, I have to give it also to the council. And I was not convinced whether from the council are always coming good things. Uh, but now when Barroso 1, 2, Juncker and von der Leyen is making now these steps, I think it will be en passant. Uh, um, uh, on the way down to an to a evaluated treaty that we change that. It is not really a, an impact anymore. We just don't have it because it's difficult to change the treaties. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And uh, apart from the European elections, I think that the Commission itself has also been putting a lot of efforts in also um, bringing about like communication and campaigns around the EU Take the Initiative, which is the official, let's say, hashtag of the European Citizens Initiative, and plus uh, the mechanism of the ECI Forum, in which we are also collaborating with SecGen on um, making sure that there, are, there is tailor-made advice for ECI organizers. Now, uh, the legal admissibility is a bit easier because in the very beginning, the Commission would really take every single point of the ECI organizers, and if there was one point that didn't fall under the competences of the Commission, they would also discard the ECI, but nowadays uh, um, they're much more flexible, so they have also been doing an effort because they've seen that it has brought a lot of frustration, I think, on this side. Exactly, and the court, of course, uh, in well, many cases, actually ruled a certain, uh, you this know, not only this uncourt. Come, come from their own initiative. Yeah, I mean, they had to be forced to a certain degree. And also, let's remind us: in 2016, the College of the Commission said the ECI, mom, dad, and kids, yeah, on a uh, conservative family model, they considered as a threat. And, and in general, also the ECI, they considered the ECI as a threat to the European Union system. Yeah, and this was just before Brexit. Uh, British uh, media took this up. This was a very counterproductive uh, step. But in the meantime, the, the um, attitude has changed, and that's very important to make democratic institutions work. We need a clear commitment uh, to, to make them work, and that it's something positive to be put into question might not be so... Uh, 
nice and uh, comfortable in the first uh, instance, but in the long term, it will improve the legitimacy and the support of the EU system um, heavily. And I think the Commission has now understood it, and we are very uh, curious how the new Commissioner, Mrs. Vera Jourova, will, will really deal with that. It has a lot to do with those who are in power. Mm -hmm. But the instrument is stronger and, and better than in the vast majority of the member states. I mean, we have to say that very clearly. Deep we are far ahead. Depends if you look at Finland and Latvia. On the vast majority. Yeah. <laughs> On the vast majority. How do you define better? Also, your, your criterion is outcome we could discuss further. Better and stronger. Yeah, in what term? Well, I think that we have an expert actually on more yeah, like we do not have at all in, in some of the democracy. Member states. <laughs> yeah, let's discuss this. Okay. Sure. Well, um, uh, now after speaking about the EU tools about participatory democracy, actually we have a practitioner more on the local uh, um, level. Um, Attila, actually, uh, my questions to you were really regarding these initiatives that you've also been running or contributing. Also, your role as, let's say, an important role in the media. Um, you know, um, uh, how important it is to communicate to citizens that these tools actually exist and, and meet their expectations also about the, the impact. But uh, most importantly, I think that it is important to understand what can we transpose from the local initiatives, successful local initiatives of participatory democracy to the EU level, knowing that the EU level is much more complex and, uh, you know, takes into consideration a lot of uh, different challenges that maybe local territories don't have. Thank you. And uh, it seems that I'm the outsider here at this panel. And uh, I try to connect uh, to this debate from a local level. And I don't know if uh, every local initiative must uh, get to the EU level. Uh, uh, certainly not. But uh, to understand what I will speak about, I have to make a short introduction. Uh, I am uh, the deputy chief editor uh, at the uh, Romanian Regional Station. It's uh, Mar Maros Vasarhei Radio in Hungarian. Uh, since 2013, uh, we have uh, our own program in Hungarian. Uh, since uh, then, uh, we um, uh, try to get out from the studios and uh, we said that it's not enough to make a radio from, from the studio. Uh, the radio is very old, it's uh, 61 year old, but uh, the last 58 years uh, we had a common program with the Romanians. And um, we, are, uh, it's, we are very proud to say it, uh, the most listened Hungarian radio station in, uh, in Romania. Uh, we are broadcasting for uh, four counties. Uh, uh, I don't know what do you know about Romania, but there are <laughs> a lot of Hungarians in these four countries. It's about Hargita, Kovasna, Muresh and Brasov. And uh, in these four countries lives uh, uh, almost 600,000 Hungarians. And uh, all the studies show that we are listened by more than 200,000 every day. So it's, uh, uh, we are the most listened and we are very relevant. And, uh, we don't have the privilege as uh, the big uh, Romanian uh, public broadcasters have that the, they have separate channel for news, for culture, for youth, for anything. We are uh, all in one service. And for this, I, I have a short video. It's in Hungarian, but you will understand it because it's, uh, uh, it's very easy and it's one minute long. So it's, uh, Okay, I'm sure that you understood. <laughs> um, uh, uh, 
we show that we are a news radio, we are a radio for old people, we are a radio for youths, we are a radio for uh, culture, for sports, uh, it's an all-in-all uh, service. And uh, that's how we manage to get to all these, to all these people, and it's uh, a very hard task to do it day by day, uh, because when we are broadcasting to the younger generation, the orders are upset, when we are broadcasting to the orders, the youngers are leaving us, and we have to find the, the right balance uh, every, every day, and it's, it's a very critical uh, uh, job, job to, to, the, to do. But uh, besides that, uh, uh, we uh, consider that it's not enough to speak to them uh, on the radio waves, we have to be among them every time. So every major event, uh, if there is in Transylvania, the people are asking where is the Maros Vasarhei radio if we are not there. Uh, so we are very credible and uh, if we are not there at an event, uh, they are writing us and uh, calling me personally uh, why the Maros Vasarhei radio was missing from I don't know what event. So we have to be uh, there at every event. It's, uh, we can talk about the visit of the Pope, but uh, if there is a, a major sports event or cultural event, we, we have to be there. And it's not <laughs> easy because we are a public uh, uh, station and our funds are very limited. I don't want to get <laughs> into this subject, but uh, it's uh, the finance of, of the public uh, broadcasters. It's, it's a critical uh, situation in, in Romania. And um, uh, to, to prove that uh, we, are, uh, we, can, we can generate debates, we can uh, uh, thematize uh, uh, some, some very actual topics, uh, I show you some other videos. One of them is about uh, uh, the situation of the garbage is all over Transylvania. I don't know if you have been there. It's a very beautiful uh, region, but uh, you can find trash uh, all over uh, uh, you go. And uh, we have a river, it's a Murash River, it's a nice river in near my town. And uh, every year we have uh, a performance there. Uh, yes, uh, I agree with that. We uh, do this event uh, every year. This was the third year, and around uh, 800 people are coming, and uh, we are involving local communities, uh, uh, big uh, companies, uh, small companies, NGOs, schools. Uh, while we are doing this, uh, we have a draw contest for, uh, for kids. Uh, so the whole community is uh, interested to come there, and uh, it's, a, it's a very effective way to show that there is a, a, a problem, and uh, local authorities uh, should do something about, about uh, that. Uh, the other uh, project uh, of uh, the Maros Vasarhei Radio is uh, it's called Let's Talk. Let's talk, it's a, a debate. Uh, we invite uh, for a topic uh, the most relevant people from our cities, local authorities, uh, company managers, uh, NGOs, uh, listeners. It, it's an open uh, show. And um, uh, our goal was to move the debates from Facebook, from chats, from comments. And uh, let's talk face to face uh, and uh, let's see what can we do together better. 
because we not believe that you can solve problem on commenting on Facebook. Uh, and uh, since last year, we started this uh, this uh, project. Uh, I hope that this is the link. Yes. Uh, it's in Hungarian. I, I uh, won't uh, let it go for long. We don't have voice, but uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, um, the debates looks like this, but it's broadcasted live and uh, on internet, and uh, you can uh, comment and you can ask and. Uh, uh, we are trying to uh, speak about uh, the most hot topics in our community, uh, but which are on in the in the media uh, right at, at the moment. Uh, we had for uh, uh, street performances was the first because the uh, um, local administration. Ha uh, had to take a decision about who can and how can uh, perform on street. Uh, and uh, it generated a debate between the artists and the uh, uh, authorities. Uh, and we said, OK, let's see where is the truth and, the truth and what can we do to, to have a, a good solution for, for everyone. And it was a success because after our debate, uh, they withdrew the, the decision and, uh, and uh, made it a better one together with the artists. Uh, and uh, we have several uh, uh, debates li like this, from public transportation, from garbage management, uh, and, and, and so on. And uh, the good stuff that uh, the good thing is that uh, uh, the politicians, the local authorities, are coming. I don't have to ask them uh, and to write them uh, SMS or uh, send them invitation. We just announce them. That there is a debate. This is the topics, and uh, if they are not coming, uh, uh, th that is a, uh, a message also. And uh, probably it's better to come and stay there and listen to the critics and uh, eventually if you have a, a good answer, probably the, the listeners and the voters uh, will have a chance to know that uh, in fact the local authorities are doing or trying to do uh, their best. Uh, uh, their best. So th this is a, a project uh, of us we like, we like uh, a lot and uh, we are uh, convinced that uh, this is the way to communicate on, on a local level and to try to move the debates from Facebook and, and other social media platforms because they are not going anywhere. Uh, I think uh, it, it was important, this, this local insight, because exactly the topics that he was announcing about uh, what are the, the problems of the local community then arrive in the European Parliament in the Petitions Committee. And just looking to the topics that uh, were submitted by, by citizens, now environment is on the first place. Uh, and the number of petitions doubled in four years on environment uh, issues. Then we have the fundamental rights as the second most uh, submitted issue, which tripled in, uh, in, uh, in four years. Uh, so already 15% of, of, uh, 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 of the petitions are on fundamental rights. Then uh, we have a, a new category of personal issues raised by citizens, of course not in uh, uh, EU competence, uh, but citizens like uh, want an instance where they can just write a letter, uh, have, their, have their say, it's for more than 14% uh, is on personal issues. Then we have on justice, a small raise in numbers, and the health. Health became uh, the fifth issue for the citizens and doubled the number of, of petition on this. Uh, it is interesting to see also the, 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 the countries that are uh, mostly active, citizens. Uh, first is Spain with 13%. Spain's are the more, more active petitioners in, in Europe. Then uh, Germany and, uh, and Italy and Romania is in the fourth place. So this is the, the, the first uh, uh, new uh, member state that uh, is uh, interested in uh, in uh, putting out uh, petitions absolute numbers already, in, in absolute numbers. Yes, uh, uh, 
Now, the part of uh, admissibility of, of the, uh, uh, of the uh, petitions, because that is the most important criteria which will be considered to have a, a dialogue with the Commission and uh, perhaps the Member State, uh, around 64% uh, of the uh, of the inquiries are uh, declared admissible and uh, about one third are inadmissible in the first instance and, uh, and then uh, the process gets, can uh, continue with, with the admissible ones. Yeah. Just, just a short to put the local uh, in, into a more uh, European framework as well. You know, the citizens' concern is about the same topic. Uh, and then we see the evolution of the society also in the numbers and topics of, of the petition. Environment is uh, not surprisingly uh, on the first place now. Definitely. Thank you for complementing to what Attila just said. Are there any questions? And <laughs> uh, thank you very much for the for the speeches. It's it's very interesting to listen. But I especially have a question to you. What is the expectation management? Uh, if I understood you properly, you are now 17 years, 19 years uh, busy with this European Citizens Initiative, and you said in one sentence that none of them has been successful. And uh, then I go back to your uh, garbage in, in the river. There the people go home in the evening with a lot of bags, with all this uh, gar garbage, and they have a concrete result. Uh, personally, I think the EU is too big for one citizen. You, you can't... You can't uh, uh, confirm the EU by one citizen. Of course, then you join them, but at the end, what the populists, they misuse, I think, the, the non-result of the European citizen initiatives. Or is this too negative? No, that's, uh, well, for, thank you. Or, Was uh, there another for the question? question? I just had one question for Attila before we and then I'll pass. I, w I just wanted to know, like, so is the radio independent from any political influence? Did any political um, leaders, like local mayors or local politicians, ever contact you because they were interested in collaborating because they thought that these participatory democracy, you know, mechanisms are working very well, so they want to to use some of it also to, to improve their policy making or something? Or is it just like independent? And if it is independent, do you think that NGOs and radios and let's say, you know, intermediary actors in society between citizens and decision makers are maybe better in place to, to work with uh, participatory democracy or should it be more like formal mechanisms coming more from national governments or local politicians? But uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, you, you are the first. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah. Um, so first I uh, uh, will answer to you. Um, the, the garbage collected uh, during that, uh, those actions are, are uh, managed by the company from our city and uh, delivers to the place it should be. Uh, we are trying to involve uh, everyone in these, uh, in these actions. Uh, and uh, here I answer to you, even the local authorities, the mayors are coming. They know that there is a uh, big uh, uh, crowd uh, there and a lot of people are involved and, and they are coming. I, I don't have to call them, look, Mr. Mayor, we have a garbage collect. No, they, we are promoting on Facebook, on, 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 uh, on uh, on uh, radio and uh, they can listen it because they are listening. But uh, here is a, a, a big uh, 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 nuance uh, that uh, probably don't every doesn't know or doesn't understand. Uh, being a Hungarian broadcaster in Romania, it's it's a little bit different because the whole community is very. Uh, uh, connected and uh, uh, they are paying attention what's going on in our radio station. Uh, don't misunderstand me because we have a lot of commercial Hungarian station, but uh, they uh, are not so powerful or so credible than, than we are. And uh, when we are doing these kind of events, uh, the local authorities are coming. 
Uh, I, I have to call to the companies, look, come with uh, six cars because we have too, uh, too many uh, garbages, but uh, I don't have to pray to them, to the mayor, come. It, it's in his interest to come. And if it's not coming, it's his uh, decision. Did you have yeah. a report about a European citizens initiative or something? Uh, what we discuss here also, a European... Uh, of course, yeah. we have the minority... Uh, Safe pack, and uh, it, it's a debate uh, even in uh, our community, and uh, it was promoted because we are interested uh, in it, and uh, we had a lot of talk about it. Yes. I want to stress before I have to run because we have group meeting. Um, <laughs> uh, possibly the question of independent. I mean, no money from the government, no money from industry, but possibly support from others. Independent is a very difficult point. I mean, I wonder, I wonder if these random chosen citizens, if you talk with people organizing, they say, okay, of course they are advised by experts. Hmm? I mean, it, it, it's worth to have a look on the experts. I, I wonder whether the result of the Irish random um, um, uh, citizens, uh, if they would have the same result if the experts advising them or the moderators were from the Catholic Church. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you ever have a look what is the motivation of the person who is doing that. And I think in terms of political science, it could be a, a very good exercise to build two or three of random communities and then send them a moderator with the task to bring them into that direction or into that direction to look how successful this ca that can be. Because this is also a, 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 a form of um, uh, corriger la fortune. And if we look to the, to the German independent media, they will ask, what is your politi political preference? And out of the, the, the media people from print and electronic media, who gave an answer, 70% said C, uh, SPD and Greens. So yeah. it has, it, it, it's worth to have a second look on the question independent. Yeah. Possibly yeah. this is the big black box in it. I think selecting the experts, advising these uh, random citizens assemblies is a crucial uh, methodological question that needs to be clarified in advance, yeah, that this is ensured. This would go probably too deep into this, but uh, Mr. Wieland, it would be wonderful to really follow up uh, this discussion. I know you have to uh, leave very soon, but I think uh, uh, this is... Yeah, and I come back to your question also. But since uh, also one question I want to give you on the way, so to say, sorry to uh, be so late now, uh, Mr. Wieland, in Germany, the ECI is now reformed in the German Bundestag. Um, and there, the government coalition is unclear about whether we should reduce the minimum age uh, from 18 to 16 or not. And here I would uh, love to invite you to think about it, uh, to possibly reduce it. Also being aware that the citizens' initiative, the European citizens' initiative, is really not, an not comparable to any election. Huh? Uh, it's just to, it's, it's about to bring something on the agenda for public discussion. That's the expectation management. And uh, we should separate this from the general debate if to... Uh, de I have a very clear point on that. Yeah. Somebody who wants to drive with uh, 16 or an, and to vote with 16 years also go to prison if he has done something wrong. Yeah, but participating... <laughs> yeah, voila. Election, that's clear. But <laughs> taking part... All with the same and the ECI as well, you think, or... Well, okay, well, anyway, good. Um, Thank you, Mr. Wiedemann. That <laughs> would be great to follow up this discussion. Uh, regarding the follow-up of successful ECIs, yeah, I said in the first five years there was no follow-up at all. Yeah, they were, were all, the ECIs at least felt all ignored. There was no legislative proposal. There, however, came one on the water directive on the first successful ECI right to water to improve the water quality. And this was one of the goals. There were like at least seven or eight goals of the first EC, uh, right to water ECI. The main dominating was actually to uh, not to privatize water services at municipality level. This was uh, the main goal. And uh, 
uh, ironically, Mr. Barnier was then the Minister for the uh, Binnenmarkt, the Internal Market, I think, and responsible for the Water Concession Directive. And Commission. Commissioner, voila. And, uh, sorry. and uh, he back then, already while they just had reached the million, but they were still in the process, they were negotiating this, uh, uh, this uh, directive or regulation. And uh, then they took the water privatization out of the concession directive. So in that sense, you can say it has had an effect. And there you see also the nature of this instrument. Yeah? It, it was not a logical, linear uh, thinking of you finalize an ECI and then you change the law. Here it was already shaped by the public debate uh, that it was the case that many people don't want to have privatized water services. But general, under the line, I would still say uh, the impact has been relatively low of the successful ECIs. Yeah? Um, also, Ben Glyphosate uh, had a huge amount of signatures and what they reached was not a ban of glyphosate immediately, um, but as you know, it will be phased out uh, most probably um, also at European level very soon. So it has influenced the debate and it, what they have changed legally is the admissibility process of new pesticides. Yeah? So that companies like Monsanto have to make public their own uh, scientific assessments before they said this is a business secret, we cannot publish this. So it's a bit difficult to say impact or not impact. Um, not, none of them have been implemented 100%, but there has been some change. And we would like to see more yeah, more and also with minority safety to see more and, and the other three to come now, Eat Original just has reached a million last uh, week, um, to have more transparency on what is in our food yeah, and where it comes from. And uh, the other one is uh, and the cage age on animal cr cruelty. I think it will be important to get to, to implement it. And the expectation management is the following. Citizens should have at least the impression that, they, that there are once in a while a successful ECI. If there's none, it makes no sense to make use of an ECI. Well, thank you very much. I think that uh, in the next uh, five years you will be striving for even further improvement of this tool. But I would ask also Laurent and, and Attila maybe um, just con some concluding remarks. What should the EU institutions actually be prioritizing in order to improve participatory democracy? Should it be about improving the existing tools that we have? Should it be creating new channels? Should it be about developing strongly like local and national initiatives so that they, they also push up? Or maybe the Conference on the Future of Europe, maybe that's something big that uh, um, it should be prioritizing. So. I, I believe uh, all this is coming, uh, one after the other, and, and I don't believe that uh, we should uh, reinvent the wheel. I mean, uh, uh, all these tools that exist can be improved, uh, can be more efficient, but uh, uh, I don't think so that they should be replaced with, uh, uh, with something new. Uh, let's see, for example, what the new regulation on the ECIs will bring, how this will work, and we will have a, a fair uh, opinion on one or two years, and uh, then we can have, again, uh, you know, uh, uh, some conclusions. Uh, future of Europe. Yes, I think it will be an important tool. Now, to discuss in which group, in which format, who is representing what, what is the expectation management, and I like this, I will use this term <laughs> uh, uh, from here, because it, it is really the essence. I mean, uh, we put the citizens in, in front of a choice, they make the choice, uh, but maybe they will ha not have the result that they are waiting for. So they uh, uh, should have next to this prescription also the details of the product that they are buying uh, in terms of uh, if these democratic uh, uh, tools. Uh, and I see also a strong cooperation between the actors. Uh, I don't believe it's, uh, it's only to the uh, Commission or the, the Parliament to decide things. Uh, I think it has to be based on a broad uh, consultation uh, with NGOs, hopefully with representative NGOs, as we heard, it's important legitimacy as well. Uh, in, in our business, uh, but I am a, I am a, a, a realistic when, when it comes. I, I never say I'm optimistic that uh, ECIs will, will, uh, will thrive and, and all the tools of the participatory democracy will bring everything that the citizens want. No, it has to be uh, a process where uh, the good, uh, uh, the good uh, outcome is that society will get something improved, not the single citizen, not the group, but the society as a whole will, will, will have a gain. Thank you. Any wishes, Attila? 
Not which is, I just like to uh, comment what Lawrence said uh, about the, the details, how the details uh, should uh, get to the to the people, and uh, this is a challenge even for us because nowadays, uh, as we can see, people are uh, waiting for short and clear answers, and no one is uh, curious to find out the details we are talking about. Okay, well, thank you very much for everyone for, for joining this workshop. And uh, I would give a round of applause to our speakers as well uh, for this uh, interesting time.